Um, Michelle Georges has been uh, uh, a rock in helping us try to understand the legal and um, statutory framework for potentially restoring sea otters to Oregon. Uh, so uh, she has agreed to give us the talk today of what she and her legal colleagues within the Department of Interior have uh, framed as the potential legal and administrative uh, pathway for us. So Michelle, I'm, uh, I think we're ready to go with you. Is that correct, Chanel? Yep. All right. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. and I'm going to stop my, let's see, I'm not screen sharing, you are Chanel, so there we go. Yeah. Okay. okay, let me see if I can get it going here. Can you let me know if you can see that? Not yet. Your video is also not on, if, if, if that matters or not. I on. actually was going to keep that off just so that I'm not distracting while I talk. Okay. But can you still not see the slide? Not yet. No. Oh, brother. Okay, hold on. Oh, technology, the joys. As Michelle's working on her presentation, just a reminder to use the Q&A feature um, for Zoom at the bottom of your screen for any questions that pop up uh, for any of our speakers. Can you can you see it now? Uh, no, are you, uh, have you shared screen? The I have, shoot, I have, hold on. I've shared it several times. Well, as a, as a friend of mine once said about this technology, it's a thrill a day with this stuff. Up, here we go. There you go. Good. All that right. It? Excellent. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, thank you for your patience, everyone. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate your interest in this topic. Um, I know that regulatory and legal considerations may not be the most fascinating subject necessarily, but um, it's it's very important in that it really does shape the universe of options uh, that could potentially be available in considering the reintroduction of sea otters to Oregon. So just to give you a little bit of background about why the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is involved, uh, a lot of people think that otters are managed by the National Marine Fishery Service or NOAA, but under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, authorities for marine mammals are shared between the two um, agencies. So uh, NIMPS has all the cetaceans and pinnipeds except for walruses. And then the Fish and Wildlife Service has all other marine mammals, including the sea otter. So we started working with the Alaka Alliance several years ago um, when they first came to us and were uh, interested in looking at the possibility of restoring sea otters and wanted some guidance on what the Fish and Wildlife Service would be looking for to consider a potential reintroduction and also what would be required in terms of permits and laws and so forth. So we started having these discussions and the Fish and Wildlife Service was uh, very interested in exploring this idea further um, because restoring species to their native ecosystems is a, a key part of the Fish and Wildlife Service mission. And in addition to that, under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, it very closely aligns with a couple of our key objectives that are identified by statute, one of which is to maintain marine mammals as a significant functioning element of the ecosystem of which they're a part, and also to maintain the health and stability of the marine ecosystem. So um, as both of the prior speakers laid out for you very nicely, as a keystone species that has uh, far-ranging effects on the structure and function of the nearshore marine environment, um, it very closely aligns with these objectives. So we're interested in uh, supporting a feasibility study, looking at all the uh, questions that are associated with a potential sea otter reintroduction, while remaining mindful that it does have um, consequences on many fronts and we'd wanna be very thoughtful in um, moving forward. So there's a lot to think about with regard to potential reintroduction. It's a very complex undertaking. I also wanted to mention because um, some people may have heard that um, there is another feasibility study going on. Um, at the end of last year, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was also directed to look at the feasibility and cost of sea otter reintroduction. Um, this came in the form of language that was in the Omnibus Appropriations Bill that was signed into law at the end of December last year. 
and uh, gave us a somewhat broader uh, mandate. And that was to look at reestablishing sea otters on the Pacific coast of the contiguous United States. So we are in the process of producing that report to Congress, looking at California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, that'll be uh, made available at the end of December. So there's two kind of um, parallel but separate efforts that are going on right now. So to talk about the legal uh, framework for sea otter reintroduction, we need to understand a little bit about uh, the taxonomy and the different entities that might be involved because they'll have different levels of protections. So for sea otters, the um, and Hydrolutris, the species, they are broken into three separate recognized subspecies. These are based primarily on skull morphology, but are also supported by molecular evidence. So we have the Russian or Asian sea otter, also known as the Northern sea otter. Uh, the Northern sea otter, which is also known as the Alaskan sea otter, and then the Southern sea otter, uh, which is the California sea otter. So here's a map showing where the subspecies occur. So purple is that Russian or Asian subspecies. The uh, turquoise is the northern sea otter, which includes the translocated populations that you just heard Jim Botkin talking about. And then the green is the southern sea otter in California. So they have different statuses um, and under both the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. So under the Endangered Species Act, two of these populations are listed. The uh, Southwest Alaska distinct population segment listed as threatened in 2005. And then the Southern Sea Otter in California was listed as a threatened species under the ESA back in 1977. So Oregon is interesting in that we think, and uh, Sean Larson is going to be talking more about this, but um, all the genetic evidence suggests that Oregon historically was a transition zone between those northern and southern subspecies of sea otters. So looking at uh, genetic evidence from uh, historical specimens from different parts of the Oregon coast, um, specimens from up in northern Oregon tend to align most closely on a genetic basis with the northern sea otter subspecies, whereas specimens that we've collected from the south and central coast of Oregon align more closely with the southern sea otter. So it seems like there was this genetic cline uh, that occurred along the Oregon coast. The other thing I'll mention here is that the um, southern sea otter has lower genetic diversity than any of the other sea otter populations throughout the range that have been sampled. And we think that, um, I mean, it makes sense. They had a very low number of founding individuals, probably fewer than 50 individuals that survived the fur trade in California. So there was a uh, genetic bottleneck there. And then also they've remained isolated from all of the uh, northern uh, populations of sea otters. We've got that 900 mile stretch between um, Half Moon Bay in California and up in Point Grenville in Washington where we still no, do not have sea otters. So lack of gene flow is a real problem. So early on with the Alaka Alliance, um, our first recommendation was that we needed a really thorough feasibility study that um, Tim just walked us through all the elements of this, but um, that considers not only the biological and ecological considerations, but um, of equal importance, uh, socioeconomic considerations. So that uh, there's a lot of both positive and negative impacts that could come from a, a restoring the sea otter to the Oregon coast. We need to very carefully consider all of those and ways that um, if you were to proceed with a reintroduction, you could um, avoid or minimize any of those um, unintended adverse consequences as much as possible. And then the legal considerations, which we're gonna talk about today, that kind of frame um, the opportunities and options and potential constraints for what you might be able to do. So um, the primary laws we're gonna talk about today are the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act, as it applies to some of the populations, not all of them, and then the National Environmental Policy Act. And if we have time, I'll talk briefly about uh, a law that was associated with that uh, translocation that we just heard about to San Nicolas Island. So the Marine Mammal Protection Act is where we'll start. 
Um, this was passed in um, 1972. It protects all marine mammals under US jurisdiction from unauthorized take. So there's a take moratorium under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and take is defined as to harass, harm, capture, or kill any marine mammal. But you can get a permit for intentional take. So for example, if in the course of scientific research, public display, photography, or enhancing survival um, or recovery of species or stock, which is what we would be looking at with um, reintroducing sea otters on the Oregon coast. There's also, um, I'll just mention an exemption, but that exemption is uh, specific to Alaskan natives. So it's defined as uh, natives, Native Alaskans who um, are of Indian Aleut or Eskimo heritage, residing in Alaska and dwelling on the coast. And those Alaskan natives um, are not prohibited from take of marine mammals for subsistence purposes, uh, for creating and selling handicrafts and clothing, and as long as it's not accomplished in a wasteful manner. There's also incidental take. Incidental take is take that occurs in the course of an otherwise lawful activity, but it is not the purpose or intent of that activity to take that marine mammal. So that can also be authorized under the Marine Mammal Protection Act through a um, variety of authorizations or permits. Um, and incidental take is allowed if it's in a spe specified geographic area and involves a small number of animals, will not have more than a negligible impact on the species or stock, and as long as it won't affect the, the availability of that species or stock for subsistence uses by coastal dwelling Alaska natives. So you might um, have heard the terms in incidental harassment authorization or a letter of authorization. That's what allows for incidental take um, in the course of uh, certain activities and which one you get depends on the severity and the duration of the activity that's in question. So for example, um, building a dock that might um, uh, technically result in harassment. You know, you're, you're changing the behavior of the sea otters in the area might um, require incidental harassment authorization. Now, something that's very important to keep in mind when we're thinking about sea otters is that um, under section 118 of the Marine Mammal Protection Act, there's a whole long detailed section there that is specific to incidental take in the course of commercial fishing operations. So um, in commercial fisheries, as if you're on a US vessel, you've got a fishing permit um, under Magnuson-Stevens, as long as you have a valid fishing permit, you can get an authorization for incidental take. And as I mentioned, this section is very long. There's a lot of um, kind of nuances to it um, and different requirements. So if you do take a marine mammal, there's a, a reporting requirement. But what I particularly wanted to point out is that um, there is language in the MMPA that is specific to uh, what they call the California sea otter. So that's the actual language used in the MMPA. So you can think of that as the Southern sea otter. The California sea otter, there is no authorization of incidental take for California sea otters from commercial fishing operations. Um, that is very specifically laid out in the MMPA. And you can think of that as following these individuals around wherever they may be. So even if you were to bring Southern sea otters to Oregon, um, that provision of the MMPA would still apply. As written at this point in time, there would be no um, authorization of incidental take from commercial fishing operations for southern sea otters. The other thing is that under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, there is no kind of provision for an experimental population designation, similar to that which we have under the Endangered Species Act, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute, but that's a, a provision that provides us great flexibilities with regard to um, relaxing take prohibitions for species um, in the course of trying to uh, achieve recovery by establishing new populations and trying to reduce the regulatory restrictions that might come along um, with a, a listed species. But we don't have that option available to us under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. It's important to keep that in mind because those two things are independent of another. Um, regardless of whether the species is listed or not, 
I think the key takeaway there is that protections of the Marine Mammal Protection Act always apply. The other thing I wanted to point out is that um, there is a section of the MMPA that retains management authority for sea otters with federal agencies, unless that authority is specifically transferred by the secretary to a state if the state requests it. Um, this has only occurred once uh, since the MMPA was passed, to my knowledge. Uh, the state of Alaska briefly had management authority over walruses, but then relinquished that later. So at this point in time, there are no states that have that authority. Um, this authority has to do specifically with um, laws or re regulations relating to take of marine mammals. So states cannot regulate take of marine mammals. Only the federal agencies can at this point in time. So the Endangered Species Act. Um, right now, as I mentioned, we have two populations of sea otters that are listed under the ESA, uh, both, both listed as threatened, um, one being that uh, DPS up in Southwest Alaska and the other being the Southern Sea Otter. So similar to the MMPA, the ESA, as prohibitions against the take of listed species, the Section 9 prohibitions. Uh, take under the ESA has a little bit more expansive definition to harass, harm, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. So um, any of those actions would be a violation of the ESA with respect to southern sea otters or otters in that Alaska DPS. But again, take can be authorized by permit. And we do, uh, very similar to the MMPA, have a direct take permit for what's called a recovery permit or a 10A1A permit that permits scientific research, enhancement of survival, or applies to those um, experimental populations, establishing those. There's also uh, opportunities for incidental take permits, 10A1A, I'm sorry, 10A1B permits um, that will uh, authorize incidental take uh, same definition there, take that occurs in the course of otherwise lawful activities. So you're just going about your own business and um, happen to uh, annoy a listed species that's considered incidental take or harm a listed species. That would be incidental take. That would technically be a violation of the act without coverage. Other things that come along with the ESA, uh, critical habitat. When species are listed under the Endangered Species Act, we are also required to designate critical habitat for those species. The other thing that comes along with the listing is a consultation requirement. This applies to federal agencies. Um, and what it does is establishes that any agency action shall not jeopardize the continued existence of a listed species or destroy or adversely modify its designated critical habitat. Any agency action that is funded, implemented, permitted um, by a federal agency that may affect a listed species has to undergo consultation. You'll hear this uh, section seven consultation is the way you usually hear it referred to. So here's my, my favorite part of the Endangered Species Act on um, the section 10J. Um, I, I like Section 10J because it provides us great opportunities to reestablish listed species in portions of their historical range um, without all that additional baggage that I just talked about uh, that comes along with an ESA listing. So Section 10J allows us to uh, establish an experimental population of a listed species. We can release individuals from that species uh, with the intention of uh, creating a new population outside of the current range that's occupied, but within its historical range. And then that new experimental population at the time of establishment has to be kept wholly separate from any other existing populations of the species. That's because they have different levels of protections and if they overlapped, you wouldn't be able to tell which one is which. So when you first establish it, they have to be separate from other populations. The first determination that you have to make for an experimental population is whether it's essential or non-essential. An essential population 
is considered essential to the continued existence of the species. So in other words, an essential experimental population, the entire future of the species would ride on that experimental population. We've never done that. All of our experimental populations so far have been non-essential in nature. So if it's non-essential, you get all kinds of great flexibilities that come along with it. One is that you can, um, you, you are in charge of what the Section 9 prohibitions are against take. And that can include saying that there is no incidental take of individuals in that population. So people don't have to get permits. They don't have to be worried about violating the act um, if there's incidental take that's occurring. There's no critical habitat for an experimental population, and there's no consultation requirement except for on National Wildlife Refuge or National Park lands. The National Environmental Policy Act um, is also something that would come into play. Um, it requires federal agencies to assess effects of their proposed actions on the environment. Criteria are the same as we talked about for um, these earlier regulations. Any action that's authorized, funded, or implemented by a federal agency is subject to NEPA. So in this case, I'm looking at reintroduction, it would be uh, the permits required under the Marine Mammal Protection Act or the ESA or both, depending on which populations you're dealing with, that would trigger NEPA and require the preparation of an environmental impact statement. So importantly, um, NEPA only comes into play at the point at which you have an actual proposal or application in hand. It doesn't apply in, um, situations as where we are today, where you're just contemplating the possibility of taking an action and, and, and considering it, talking about it, um, NEPA is not triggered by that. But once you have that application um, or a formal proposal, then at that point, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service would have to consider uh, the environmental, social, and economic impacts of whatever the proposed action would be. Maybe that's issuing a permit and considering what all the consequences of that would be. And what I wanted to point out here is that there are multiple opportunities uh, for public input in the NEPA process. It starts with scoping. Um, we have hearings and talk to um, members of the public and tribes and states about you know, what are the important considerations that should be rolled into the NEPA process. And all of those are developed into a draft environmental impact statement that evaluates the effects of the action under several different alternatives, the proposed alternative, as well as um, maybe optional, uh, some, some different kinds of considerations, different alternatives that might be um, under consideration, as well as the no action alternative. And it ends uh, with the final environmental impact statement and a record of decision. There's a whole host of other laws and regulations um, that would also apply to uh, sea otter reintroduction. And we're not going to talk about these at length, but I'll just identify them for you so that you know they're there. Um, a consistency determination, the Coastal Zone Management Act requires consistency with enforceable state regulations. Uh, there would be permits related to the Animal Welfare Act for the capture and transport and release of the animals, um, could be some consultation on essential fish habitat with NOAA that would be required. And then with regard to state laws, um, I mentioned that uh, MMPA, uh, there's no regulation of take by the states, but there could be other state regulations that would apply. So for example, in Oregon, um, the Oregon Department of Agriculture might require um, veterinary certification that animals being brought in are disease-free. Which source population to use? Um, I'll just say that um, any option of reintroducing sea otters that would contemplate mixing listed and unlisted sea otters at the same time would be very problematic. Um, again, because you would not be able to separate the individuals. You can't tell by looking at them which one they are. And it would be hard to know which ones are protected and which ones are not. Um, there, there might be some way through that, so some kind of legal gymnastics that I'm not aware of, um, but it, it would be more complicated. We'll just leave it at that. 
So uh, challenges associated with listed sea otters. So for a variety of reasons, southern sea otters might be a desirable source population for Oregon. Um, one of the prior speakers, maybe it was Jim Bogdan, talked about the genetics perspectives um, that you know, we had diminished uh, genetic diversity in the California population. There has been a lack of gene flow due to isolation. So rebuilding some of that diversity and enhancing the adaptive capacity of southern sea otters could be achieved through reestablishing that connectivity to Oregon between southern and northern sea otters. We do have the availability of abandoned pups. As he mentioned, that um, do have a greater retention rate than adults that are released, and it would have the potential to contribute to the recovery and delisting of the southern sea otter. We could relieve um, regulatory restrictions through using the non-essential experimental population under Section 10J of the ESA. But again, you'd still have the uh, take prohibitions from the Marine Mammal Protection Act that would be in place and there would be no relief uh, for incidental take from commercial fisheries. So I will, um, I think I've got just a couple minutes. I'll try to hit this real quickly. Just the lessons learned from that California reintroduction at San Nicolas Island. So they were trying to establish um, an additional breeding colony outside of the present range to reduce the risk primarily from oil spills. Um, and as Jim mentioned, they considered several different uh, translocation sites, but ended up at San Nicolas Island and the, the Channel Islands. So Southern Oregon was actually one of the original translocation areas that was considered. So because there's no experimental population provision under the MMPA, and there were significant concerns from the uh, fishery folks down in Southern California that uh, sea otters were gonna reduce the shellfish resources in the area, they were trying to come up with a compromise to allow the reintroduction to take place. And because there was no experimental population provision under the MMPA at the time, they actually came up with an entirely separate public law that was passed in 1986, Public Law 99625. This established separate translocation zones. This is where the otters were being moved to, and then management zones where um, those zones were supposed to be kept free of otters and the Fish and Wildlife Service and California Department of, um, I think it was Fish and Game at the time, uh, had to remove any animals that moved into the management zone. So this is what it looked like. Um, San Nicolas Island here, this white area is where the otters were supposed to stay. Uh, the hatched area, they um, had to be removed from there if they moved into them. And as Jim just laid out for you, um, the vast majority of animals did leave the island upon release. So only about 10% of the animals stayed. And um, there were tremendous problems with trying to capture and remove animals that moved into the management zone there over the years. So that ended up with um, a review of the program to determine whether it was achieving its recovery goals. And based on the high levels of dispersal that we're seeing, uh, the fact that it just was not viable to uh, try and capture and remove all the animals and moved into the management zone, as well as the injuries and stress that occurred, population targets not being met at San Nicolas, they eventually terminated that program in 2012. So the key lessons from this are that um, the animals are, are gonna go where they wanna go. We should never again be assuring the public that sea otters are gonna stay where we put them. The other key lesson is that um, the capture and removal of sea otters on any kind of long-term basis to try and keep them in a particular area is just not practical. Um, so this law is technically still on the books. Um, it, it, still would apply to a translocation of sea otters should you choose to use it, but um, the Fish and Wildlife Service would never again choose to use this particular strategy. So that was my key point I wanted to make there. Um, so that's all I have for today and um, I'll be available to answer questions for folks uh, at the end of our presentations today. Thanks.